What can I say? <clears throat> Cary Grant, eat your heart out. <laughs> um, I'm using my time in three ways. I'm going to make some remarks that are actually rather personal, but maybe explain sort of why we're here now. I will talk a little bit about maybe some of the early days of the Media Lab and why it, why it became what it was, and then I'll talk uh, as much as I can about what at least I think I'll be doing in the future with a recommendation, perhaps the end, that some of you consider more than you might have otherwise. Um, I enjoyed an extraordinarily privileged childhood from a privileged family. My grandparents were privileged, my great-grandparents. And when you grow up in that kind of family, maybe it's even a Kennedy-esque kind of family, there was an unspoken commitment not necessarily go in business or be successful, but the word achievement was used more often, and, and do things in the service of, of others. And whether you do that or not is, is to be seen, but at least there was the, the, the option. And when I went to school, high school in particular, uh, I always did well in art and I did well in math, and I was always very, What's the right word? Ballsy, I guess. In first grade, I made an appointment to see the headmaster to get my first grade teacher fired. Um, <laughs> in high school, at a boarding school, I got the headmaster to let me substitute art for sports, and that worked. And I always did well in art, and I did reasonably well in math. In fact, I did quite well. I got 800s in my SATs in math. So I went with great pride to the same headmaster who had forgiven sports and said to him, you know, I, I, I love art and I do well in math, so clearly I need to study architecture. And that wouldn't be what I'm, that puts them together. And he said to me something so profound, it took about eight or nine years for me to understand it. But he said, I like gray suits and I like pinstriped suits, but I don't like gray pinstriped suits. And phew, that went right over my head. I went to architecture school and came to MIT, thankfully. thankfully. Uh, I, actually, I only applied to one school. So I, I got whatever it was called, early admissions, and came here. And I have to say, when I walked up the steps of Massachusetts Avenue just out there, Kresge had just been built. Uh, WGBH was on Mass Avenue across above the barber shop. Norbert Wiener was walking the corridors. This was a long time ago. And I discovered over time that I didn't think of it this way. My pinstripe suit wasn't architecture, it was computers. And because of lots of things happening here, my thesis advisor was also the thesis advisor of Ivan Sutherland, of Larry Roberts. I mean, there was enough going on that when I graduated from architecture, I said to myself, very specifically, I said, how do you have an impact without waiting to be an old man and an old famous architect? And it is a profession where you tend to need a lot of time to, to make it up into the, into the big league. And I said, the way to do it is to make the tools, and you'll have more influence. You make a building or two, but if you make the tools. So that's what I did. I graduated, and I said I'd make the tools, and I stupidly took it literally and made a tool. This is 1967, 68. Uh, and highly influenced by the architect Moshe Safde, who had just done Habitat. I built a tool that would allow you to make Habitat-like things. And it didn't yet dawn on me that the way to do it was to make the tools that people use to make tools. In other words, you could, you could keep going down and have more and more impact. And finally started, uh, for a variety of reasons, something we called the architecture machine. This is the architecture machine in 68. Uh, I believe Steve Gregory who's on the, is in the audience. He's on the left of this picture. And then like a year later, still Steve Gregory in the picture, but the machine got bigger. And we started playing with 
computers where that lab actually looks very similar to the labs that are there today at the Media Lab. And then we started building devices using museums and exhibits as a way to do sort of the outrageous because you, you had, a, you had a, a, a pass where you could do things and you didn't have to necessarily justify them uh, in some scientific context, and we were allowed to play with some of the stuff you heard about before and you've seen these things. But there was a detail that most people don't know, and that is Jerry Wiesner, who, who uh, was president of MIT at the time, had a chauffeur. I don't think any president since has had a chauffeur. Uh, and Mr. Tibbs literally was his name, and he was parked at the bottom of the elevator in Building 9, where we were. And so when he walked his guests from his office to the car to go to lunch, he'd walk through the media lab. Very photogenic, very sort of interesting. He'd bring something, touch thing, find, come on, find this room that you could go into. You're completely surrounded. You could touch displays and see, see things. It was, you could, you could make a two minute visit, and it was pretty exhilarating. So, got to know him, you know, better and better and better. And then one day he confided in me that he was going to retire as president and not become chairman, because usually everybody's knocked up one, and sort of chairman, president becomes chairman, chairman becomes chairman emeritus. Uh, he said, no, I'm going to go back, do research. But there isn't a research lab for me. And I said, Jerry, I have an idea. <laughs> Let's make one. And John DeMoshe, who's here, was dean at the time. I had some stupid name, like media arts and sciences. And he said, uh-uh. Now, sweet and simple, call it the Media Lab. And that's how it happened. And thanks to William Proxmire, who was a senator uh, from Wisconsin, or maybe he was just a congressman, I think he was a senator, uh, gave something called the Golden Fleece Award each year, which was supposed to be an example of how federal funds were being used for gratuitous, silly research. And we were nominated about three or four times. And oh, how I wish in retrospect we had gotten it. <laughs> it would have been a badge of honor because at the time, the thing we were nominated for was this project in Aspen, Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> We were using taxpayer money to go to Aspen four times a year. I don't think we were living in particularly nice hotels, but it was still a trip to Aspen, and, and uh, uh, it turned out to be a very important project. The movie maps, you have it, Google, and I, could, I don't have enough time to tell you all the details, but there was something else happening at MIT, and that was the arts in general, minor white, was photography, Ricky Leacock was video. I mean, you're talking about great people came here because of Jerry Wiesner. He did that himself. He and the then chairman, Howard Johnson, were doing this because they believed not as in the arts as just a, a, a veneer or some kind of decorative element at MIT, but that it could be something much more fundamental. And since I was in the Department of Architecture, it turned out I became the academic head, whatever that meant, for all of the, the, the non-architecture elements, which was photography, video, graphic design, et cetera, et cetera. And so when the Media Lab was put together, we took all of that group with us. And I have to tell you, it really was, thanks to Jerry, um, a salon de refusé in the most profound sense. Every one of us really didn't quite belong where we were, but belonged where we were going to make it. And the Media Lab got built. Now, should we have built a building? I don't know. Um, I think so, because we then made a place. Um, it came home for at least for the 20 years uh, that I was running it. Uh, it became our home, and it grew, and we grew, and we grew, and nobody thought that we would grow quite so fast. And in, sort of in that start, same starting period, Seymour Papert and I were working with Alan Kay, whom you heard this morning, on some early 
experiments in Africa where computers and children, and uh, this is before the internet was available on any wide scale, on sort of looking at learning in the developing world and leveraging technology. Fast forward, there's Seymour, fast forward, um, 20 years, put in it all here, the first 20 minutes go here, can't do that, and flash forward, and literally 20 years later, my son Dimitri, who is here, we had built this school in Cambodia, he moved to the village, he gave the kids laptops and connected them with the satellite, and when I looked at this, I said, wow, what will normal market forces not do in this picture? And so I started the laptop project. And I say that more generally. I, it's certainly my rule of thumb, but you might sort of think of it uh, as a rule of thumb. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, at least I, I say to myself, will normal market forces do what I'm doing today? And if the answer is yes, then stop. Okay, because moral market forces will do it. You should do the things that normal market forces won't do. And I kept that as a rule of thumb. One laptop per child, I don't want to go through it, except I do remember, um, and I don't know if Kofi remembers, but we were, we were told by somebody to crank the laptops, and, and we shut the laptops and we're cranking them, and the crank falls out of his hand. <laughs> And you were such a cool cucumber, you didn't even look down. You just kept moving your hand, okay? You know, sort of as if, and I think to this day, many people don't know it was broken. Whereas most people would go eek, you know, and look down at it and drop it or feel that you've broken it. It was a wonderful, and it helped, it was a wonderful performance. Um, so then the Media Lab, I, I want to race through these to get to, uh, uh, but my point, the Media Lab did something which I think is the best thing we've done in the past 15 years, but uh, we did something five years ago, we hired Joey Ito. And boy, this place is in good hands. <laughs> so it's allowed me to come back a little bit like a grandparent. You get the assets, but none of the liabilities. They're Joey's problems. <laughs> um, and so I found myself in the past few years worrying about some things I want to tell you about in the, in the humanitarian sector. But I discovered something only about a year ago, uh, even a little less. I was at a meeting, you know, lots of famous people in the meeting, very important meeting, government meeting. Um, and all the conversation in the morning was how the world was broken into two parts. There were entrepreneurs and there were philanthropists. And entrepreneurs also means, you know, executives and heads of big companies as well as just startups and philanthropists included little NGOs and big charitable organizations. And I thought, what's wrong with this picture? What's missing? The world isn't made of just entrepreneurs and philanthropists. There's civil service and civil society. People have somehow let that drop. They don't encourage their kids, sweetheart, you should be a civil servant. My father said that to me. I remember him loud and clear, and my older brother became a diplomat because of it. But it was never the cool stuff. And you say, wow, that's what counts. If you have a civil society and the civil sector and the you know, civil service, that is not to be left off the equation. So there has been a little bit of a brain drain, and I'm now going to speak more generally, not just the, not going into civil service, but, and this won't get applause, but there has been a swing toward too much startup too many little apps companies, and suddenly too few students who graduate are worrying about big, hard problems because they can do an app. Mm. So I want to end with what's on my mind now and what I'll be doing for the, for the next few years. And 
it's taken me until very recently, actually, it's only recently, I should say, um, to understand that capitalism is not synonymous with democracy. And that you can actually have democracies that are created in ways that are much more socialist, much more, not dog eat dog, but much more raising uh, from the whole society and from the bottom up. And as part of that, it is my belief that connectivity is a human right. Now, you don't have to buy that because you can argue once you scratch the surface that human rights are things that are maybe enabled by connectivity and that connectivity itself is the enabler or the medium, but not it's a, fine. So then don't call it a human right, call it a civic responsibility. And I'm so surprised when I talk to people whether it's a cocktail party or a dinner party, and I say, you know, when you walk out on the street, you walk down your sidewalk, and there's lighting, there's illumination in the street. Now, you haven't paid for that directly. Rich people share the illumination with poor people. You walk down the street, people make money building the sidewalk, they make money cleaning it, they make it, so on and so forth. But it is not a commercial enterprise. It's part of civic responsibility. Why is connectivity not the same? Why doesn't everybody on the planet have internet connectivity free? Not low cost, free. And free means it's paid through an economic cycle that's very different. It's paid through the economic society system which creates, guess what, taxes. And all this business about lowering taxes is ridiculous. But the whole thing is paid through taxes, and then the taxes pay for civic society. Again. So what I would like to end on is how do I plan to do it? And I don't know, I'm not trying to ambush anybody. I've publicly said this. And when Coffey, you asked, do we talk to political leadership? The answer is yes, as you know I do, and I, I, I enjoy it, and I do a lot of it. But now I want to do something that may be too big to chew off. But I'd like to create a new division in the United Nations called the World Connectivity Organization. And it is to telecommunications what the World Food Program is to food. It's composed of two elements. One is a, so it's a constellation of low Earth orbiting satellites that are conspicuously above 100 miles up, hence not under anybody's jurisdiction. It's above all national jurisdiction. So you could actually create the constellation or piggyback on an existing constellation and you could provide global act where every square inch of the earth, because these things are by definition global, they're going around and around, you can't stop them. So even if the market happens to be New England, this thing still does continue around before it gets back to New England. So you have lots of them and really you could cover the world. You need nobody's permission. You don't need landing rights. Because when the people learn that by putting a teacup out, they can get 10 megabits per second, then, you know, whether they do it through, you know, a revolution in their country or they do it illicitly, uh, however it gets started. And then from the ground, how do you do it from the ground? And from the ground, you create something like a Peace Corps. Um, does, it's not about peace, it's about connectivity, it's not American, it's global, but you get the point whether it's students in their gap year, whether it's people who are between their undergraduate and graduate, but you want literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people doing this on the ground, and if they don't come to Washington or Boston or London, I mean, you can do it locally, and Nigerians can do it within Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera. You do stuff on the ground, 
And unlike the World Food Program, who feeds 50 million people a day, the roots are relatively, you don't just feed them one day and go away. Here, you feed them one day, so to speak. You get it all connected and going. You, you actually can do it more in terms of going away. So that's what's on my table. Um, and that's what I will be doing uh, as a part of the Media Lab. And in between, well, or in parallel, I should say, marvel at the spirit and energy that is there today. And I have to tell you, in all honesty, I would have never, ever predicted the impact of this. And Jerry Wiesner would have been very, very proud. Thank you very much.